When did you last have a viral infection? Um, maybe you had flu just before Christmas, or perhaps you've got a cold. There's plenty of those around. Um, well, the answer is you're fighting a viral infection right now. In fact, you're fighting several. The reason is the human herpes viruses. This is a family of eight viruses, and you've probably been infected with about three or four of those, if not more. You'll know about chickenpox, varicella zoster, you've probably had that, and glandular fever, which many students can catch around this age. But these viruses, and there's a picture of them, they have a very beautiful protein coat, and inside there, there's the DNA, double-stranded DNA. They have a number of very interesting features. The first is that they are normally silent. When you get these viruses, uh, you often don't know about it. Uh, but you carry these viruses because, remarkably, they are never cleared from your body. When you have flu, you get rid of it after a few days. But these viruses, you have to fight them for the rest of your life. Now, the way that you do that is by using your immune system. So your immune system has got to control cancers, other infections, but it has to control these herpes viruses for many, many decades. And we know that that's true because if we were to weaken your immune system, if you have to have a transplant or take drugs, then these viruses can become a real problem and they can cause disease uh, and even death. Now, the virus that I've been working on over the last few years is called cytomegalovirus. I didn't do a lot of Greek at school, but I know that cyto and megalo means cell and big. And here's a picture of... Uh, cells infected with cytomegalovirus. And you can see that the name is very true. The cell has been infected. It's taken over that cell. It's making these what we call inclusion bodies, generating vast numbers of new viruses to spread to the next person. And that cell will be destroyed soon as it releases new viruses. Now, about half of us, or 30 to 40% of us, are carrying CMV. It's extremely common. It's often transmitted by breast milk. Breast milk is a very good way of transmitting uh, a virus from one generation to the next. And it's almost always silent. That's the conventional view that this doesn't cause a serious problem in healthy people. But in patients who are immune suppressed, those in hospitals, those having kidney transplants or bone marrow transplants, this is a real threat, a real killer virus and something that we need to control. Now, it's a, it's, it is a wonderful virus. It makes 160 proteins. And uh, as I say, it, it, it replicates within a cell within 24 hours. But I'm more interested in how our body controls it. You see, I'm, my research is in immunology. And I'm interested in your immune system and how you fight this virus off for many, many decades. Your immune system is made up of cells, white cells. They're circulating in your body right now. They're called T lymphocytes. And we know that they control the virus by constantly killing any cell that becomes infected with CMV. And because uh, we were interested in CMV in our hematology patients, I was very keen to understand more about these white cells against CMV. I wanted to count them to see how many they were. I wanted to study their function and to use them. So we had to work a way, work out a way that this could be done. And so, over 10 years ago, I started some work with John Altman and Mark Davis from California. And we knew that if you had a white cell against a virus, it would stick to the virus. So in, in the laboratory, we can generate artificial forms of the virus and stick them to these white cells. But that's no good. There's no label there. It doesn't tell you anything. So what we were able to do then was to add a fluorescent molecule onto the virus, a red protein. These actually come from seaweed. If you go along the beach, you'll see proteins, uh, um, seaweed, which is very bright red, and it makes these very useful proteins which fluoresce. So we were able to construct this uh, molecule with a virus and a fluorescent tag, which then allows you to identify the white cells against a specific virus because they are marked. They are fluorescing. They're giving off this red fluorescence. What we can then do 
is that we can take blood from anybody, we can do it on you, and we can stain that blood with these reagents, and we can count the number of white cells that you have against any specific infection. So if you look at this chart behind me, that's a sample of blood from a healthy person. Every single black dot on there is a cell. It's a white cell within the blood. But it's the ones on the top right which are of interest to us because they're staining red. Those are the white cells in this patient, uh, this, this healthy person, in fact, who, that are committed to fighting CMV. Now, when we started this work, people said, well, you, you know, the immune response to CMV is going to be very small. This is a virus that's around for decades. It doesn't cause much harm. The immune response will be small. You won't probably see it. Well, as you can see, we were astonished when we first saw this. The magnitude of this immune response against CMV is extraordinary. In that case, 6% of all the white cells. But we can see levels of 10, 20, 30% or more of all white cells in blood can be fighting CMV. There is no other bacteria or virus you will ever encounter that stimulates an immune response as strong as this virus, cytomegalovirus. It was a great surprise. And it's led to lots of interesting work which, work which you carry on to this day and many other groups on understanding how this happens and why it's necessary. But we wanted to do more than that because we got into CMV because it was a problem in patients. And with patients, it's clear what's going on. They are, have weakened immune responses. They don't have those white cells. And if you don't have those white cells against CMV, the virus simply replicates out of control. This is a chest X-ray, as you, you know. And you'll see that those lungs at the bottom they're a little bit too white. There's a little bit too much cotton wool um, projection on there. That is pneumonia or pneumonitis, inflammation of the lungs. And that's due, in this case, to cytomegalovirus. And this picture of lung inflammation has been an extremely common problem in patients who have organ transplants, lung, liver, or particularly bone marrow, as we call stem cell transplants. And in the early days of stem cell transplantation, this was killing many, many people. It was a huge problem. So we now had this conundrum or opportunity that we, we knew that patients after transplants were having problems because they didn't have an immune response to CMV. We'd wiped it out with drugs. And on the other hand, we knew that healthy donors, their brother or sister or people in the laboratory, had an enormous immune response to the virus. Is there any way that we could use that by transferring cells between people? And so what we did was we went back to those scans and thought, well, we've, we know that there are so many of those white cells against CMV in a healthy person. Can we isolate them in some way? And we did that, and we used magnetic beads to pull out specifically the white cells against CMV from a transplant donor. Now, again, this had never been done before, but what it allowed us to do was to, whenever a patient developed a CMV problem, we could get the donor, ring them up, take blood on that day, purify the cells, and infuse them into the patient on the same day. And I remember that day very remarkably when we treated the first patients. Of course, we had appropriate ethics and so forth, but we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. But the patients responded very well. There were no side effects. We saw control of virus, which hadn't been controlled for weeks. And now this approach has been used in hundreds of patients around the world. And two big trials within the UK have finished very recently and will report this year. So that's been a very exciting example of taking a basic science discovery in the blood of healthy people and using it to treat patients. Well, that's a very nice story for those patients who have severe immune suppression. But at the back of my mind, I was always thinking of the question, look, here is a virus that's in most of the population and stimulates this huge immune response. Can that really be benign? 
that must be doing something perhaps detrimental, perhaps positive, because it changes the immune system so much. I could even take blood from you today and work out whether you've got the virus or not simply by looking at your immune system. I don't need to look for the virus. The fingerprint on your immune system is so strong that it's induced by CMV infection. So I was always intrigued by what this virus did on an epidemiological basis for human health. So where do we start to look for that? And what we'd noticed is that as you get older, particularly into your 70s and 80s, the immune response to CMV doesn't deteriorate. It does quite the opposite. It increases further. There'd be people in the age of 70s or 80s where half the white cells in their blood are fighting CMV. It's almost an absurd level. And so we wanted to study how CMV infection affected the health of elderly people, healthy donors. And so we, we worked with a group in Cambridge, George Sava, Carol Brain, and they'd studied over 500 people over a 20-year period. They'd taken them in 1990 and followed them for 20 years. And at entry, most people had been around the age of 70. So there'd been a lot of mortality, and they'd look closely at mortality rate and cause of death over that 18-year period. And we said to George and Carol, a very, very simple question. So, can we just have a sample of blood taken at the start of this study 18 years ago and we will separate those people who are carrying CMV infection and those who've never been infected and we'll look at their mortality over the next 18 years. What did we find? Well, what we found was something really very dramatic. Here is the life table or, or what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve. As you can see along the bottom, we've got the 18 years of follow-up in this study. And on the side, on the y-axis, you see everybody starts at 100. Everybody is alive, of course, at entry. And then we're looking at mortality over that 18 years. And we've divided this group into two. The top line is those patients who did not carry a CMV infection when they entered the study at, in 1990 whereas the bottom line is those people who were carrying a CMV infection. And you'll see that the line is dropping more quickly for patients who are carrying a CMV infection. Their mortality rate is increased, and they are dying sooner. In fact, the mortality rate every year was increased by 45%. Now, the difference between these lines is remarkably four years. And so what it shows is in this cohort of people within the UK, at the age of 70, if you were carrying a CMV infection, your life was shortened by four years. So that was really very interesting and important and something we wanted to do, do something about. The question is why? What was the cause of death? Was it cancer or chest disease or heart disease? And the answer, when we looked at it, was that patients were having problems with their circulatory system, their blood and their circulation, the heart. This is a magnetic resonance image scan. It's, it's basically a slice through the chest, and you can see the great vessel there, the aorta coming out of the heart and taking blood around the, the body. And so patients were having an excess of conditions like heart failure, and heart attacks, and strokes, and so forth. And in subsequent work, we now know that this virus makes your blood vessels stiffer, less resistant, less pliable, and affects blood pressure. And so this is something we're now working on to understand more deeply how this happens. So what can we do? It wasn't enough to understand how this was working. We want to do something about it. And so what we're now doing, we're running a study within the city where we're giving healthy, older people an antiviral tablet to work out if we can kill off the virus, kill off the CMV, and therefore reduce the immune response against the virus. And so really what we're working towards, which we'd never have predicted, is an antiviral drug that can potentially improve the performance of your heart and blood vessels and prolong life. So, is that the end of 
the CMV story. Are we just going to get better vaccines against CMV and better antiviral drugs and eradicate it completely? And consider CMV as something that uh, has been a problem in our evolution and has no benefic beneficial effects or valuable lessons for us. Well, I think not. Let's just think of this again, because here we have a virus which stimulates an incredibly strong immune response. Now, we might think that that's bad in this case, but there are many instances where we are desperate to stimulate immunity. Vaccine against cancer or malaria or HIV, of course, where we, we don't have any clear answers. So what would happen if we were to take CMV in the laboratory and engineer it to express a certain protein, a piece of HIV or piece of malaria, and then introduce it into the virus and inject that virus into a patient or a, a healthy donor, of course. Now, if you were to do that, you would predict that that would lead to a very strong immune response against your protein of interest. You might be able to use CMV as a vector for a new type of vaccine which would stimulate very strong immune re responses against problematic targets. And indeed, a group in America has now used this approach in an animal model of HIV, and it is the best candidate for providing protection in that model, and is now a leading candidate for a vaccine against HIV. We're working on an approach to use this as a potential vaccine against cancer, and there's a lot of interest now in using herpes viruses in this way. So, it may be that through appropriate manipulation of this virus, we can take what this virus has done throughout evolution, many millions of years, this ability to stimulate very strong immune responses and change it to use it for our own opportunities to create new immune responses against challenging targets of the 21st century. And we can't exactly throw caution to the wind in medical practice, but if we were to do that intelligently and involving society, that really would be a very bold step for modern medicine. Thanks very much.